Welcome to our second episode of The Half Hour, where we bring you conversations with some of Eswatini's high-profile trailblazers, where you get to know them a little better. Today, we begin a two-part series with His Excellency, the Minister of Commerce, Industry and Trade in the Kingdom of Eswatini, Senator Mangoba Kumalo. Filmed at Bush Baby Lodge, Ngonyeni, Sitfogodfo. Hosted by PhD, Pilat Lamini. Remember to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell for notifications. Good afternoon, Mdumwa. Thank you so much for having water with me uh, <laughs> at your request, I might, might I say. Mm. And thank you for the time. You know, it's been, it's been a while, but I'm very happy to, to catch up with you. And I hope you're ready to speak about your life. Pila, thank you so much. I'm really, really um, uh, grateful to be part of this. And I'm looking forward to having the next 30 minutes uh, with you and your audience. Certainly, thank yeah. you. I know you don't normally talk about yourself, but you know, today we, we want to zoom in on you because uh, not only are you the Honorable Minister of Commerce in the country, but you're also an inspiring figure. You know, and I'm speaking for myself and a lot of people that I know within my circle. And I know that for the most part, for those of us who are in the journey, you know, we'd love to emulate even half some of the things that you have, you know, have achieved, um, if possible, better, you know, but um, thank God it's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'd just love to know, you know, where you started, you know, where you're from and, and, and where you grew up. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, very humbling for you to say that. I, I don't feel I, I deserve all those, um, <laughs> uh, you know, nice words and accolades, but... Uh, one tries to make a difference. Uh, but to your um, uh, question, I, I was born in uh, Latikulu. That's where my parents, both my parents, are from. Okay. And um, uh, I grew up there when I was uh, really small, up until I was eight years old. And then my parents moved uh, to Manzini. And um, uh, so my first two years of uh, primary school were in a school in Latikulu called Salem, a primary school. Okay. Uh, and then when my parents moved to Manzini, we went into a Salesian uh, oh. primary school. So from standard one all the way till high school, uh, I was at a Salesian high school. And uh, from there then uh, obviously um, went into uh, the local university mm -hmm. to pursue a degree in um, science and uh, I measured in biology and chemistry okay and um, interestingly when I was in the third year at university I saw a gap the gap that I saw was we did not have uh, a, a, a society for the chemistry students um, yet the chemistry industry uh, in the country was quite vibrant mm -hmm. and uh, we had so much um, uh, opportunity to just interact with the business world that was not being tapped into um, wow. and I then mobilized my classmates at the time and I said can we start a chemistry society mm -hmm. uh, we called it Unicams and I was the first okay. president for that oh wow um, and uh, it was really good because we started interacting I remember with um, Swaziland beverages at the time mm -hmm. uh, as what did beverages today we started inter interacting with RSSC at the time mm -hmm. and a few other uh, companies that had a lab uh, and okay. we were trying to then you know bridge the gap between what we were learning in class uh, versus what industry wanted. Um, after I graduated looked for a job and uh, in the interim for about uh, 16 months I taught as, as a maths and science teacher um, in a school in Dondozi called Mvimbego High School mm -hmm. and um, uh, ultimately got a job in, in one of the most prestigious companies in the country, uh, Conco, which is uh, a Coca-Cola owned entity um, mm -hmm. that uh, really transformed my life. I joined Conco as a lab chemist Oh, and um, I worked in the lab for uh, just under two years um, and then there was um, a job opening for what at this time was called a production coordinator mm -hmm. uh, which was the equivalent of a production supervisor really. okay. and uh, one of the production managers at the time approached me and said we would love for you to apply for this role 
and uh, interview for it uh, because we think uh, that uh, of all the chemists that are helping us in the process, you are the one that we would love to work with the most. So I was very encouraged by that. Uh, but obviously I, I knew it was going to be difficult because at the time I was one of the people that had the least number of uh, years of service mm -hmm. in the lab. Um, um, long story short, I got the job and then I transitioned into uh, the operations of, of, of uh, uh, Conco, uh, mm -hmm. in, which, in which case then I looked after production and um, after about two years of doing that, I then um, became production manager. Uh, and um, uh, it was interesting because it was like almost two to two and a half years of being in a job and then you're moving you to, move the to the next thing. One, yeah. um, and then after becoming production manager, um, I became operations manager. Mm -hmm. uh, the operations manager then had a much wider scope. You were looking at all the different departments within production. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also looking after the warehouse and distribution as well as the maintenance um, uh, aspects. It's a big chunk of the supply chain. It was. Um, I, I think at that stage I was responsible for about 70% of the workforce. Yes, certainly. And I was really, really young. I'm realizing now how young <laughs> I was. At the time I thought I was there, but uh, I thank God that gave me the grace to be able to to, to handle that. To do it that. all. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, but, um, I did that for a number of years and uh, Coca-Cola then uh, established a program called Operational Excellence. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was a program that was trying to look at how we optimize the assets that we have globally and uh, make sure that we sweat the assets. Mm -hmm. uh, each operation is performing at its maximum um, as well as ensuring that um, the network, the supply network within the globe is optimized. Uh, in simple terms, we needed to look at uh, whether we had the right number of um, manufacturing plants, mm -hmm. um, were they producing optimally, yeah. does it still make sense from a supply chain point of view to be producing from country X rather than country Y, and inevitably where are the opportunities to consolidate um, and where are the opportunities to uh, close some uh, operations, unfortunately. They then did an exercise where they looked at what at the time was called high potential candidates across mm -hmm. the system. Yes. Um, and uh, there were some selection criteria used. And uh, God being good, I was one of um, six people chosen globally to be in that pilot uh, wow. project in, in Ireland. And this was in... Uh, 2006 mm -hmm. um, and uh, we then had an amazing privilege I'll say of working with one of the best uh, companies in the world in terms of uh, consultancy uh, called McKinsey mm -hmm. and uh, we had their partners there we had uh, some of their top um, you know um, uh, agents uh, with us in Ireland working through this particular program and they taught us uh, the operational excellence methodology and uh, at the end of a six month period um, they were then asked uh, of the six uh, co-people they were working with to recommend somebody to lead the rest of the program into other countries and uh, unbeknownst to me uh, these guys were really happy with my contribution and um, I got called into an office to say we are going to be uh, gradually uh, terminating our relationship with Mackenzie over the next six months, uh, but um, uh, we want uh, somebody to lead the program, so uh, you are going to now be the person that's going to lead the program. Exciting. And it was totally exciting. Uh, the kind of energy I felt um, is, is, is unparalleled. I can imagine. Uh, I, I just felt, you know, coming from an African country coming from a Swatini mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know having had a, an, an amazing opportunity to work with the brightest people in the system mm -hmm. uh, in the area of the business that yes. we were in uh, and uh, being handpicked by uh, McKinsey to say yeah. uh, you could uh, actually lead those teams I mean that team uh, was was one of the highlights of my my career uh, still um, and we then have to craft a program then that went into 
uh, North America. So from Ireland I went to work in a very, very beautiful part of the world. I think it's still one of the most beautiful parts of the world mm -hmm. that I've been to, a country called Puerto Rico. Uh, so I uh, stayed there for uh, some time working on operational excellence. And then we went to Atlanta as well, still leading the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, then came back to Africa, Eswatini, but still working on the operational excellence program. Um, and I was still working on that when I got a call uh, to say uh, they are looking for um, a, a, a general manager uh, in one of the plants in Canada uh, because my name was kept in uh, the list of high potential candidates. Um, I was asked to speak to those guys. It wasn't really an interview. They wanted to know if I was interested in the job. Wow. And um, spoke to the family. The family was eager to uh, explore. We, we went to Canada and um, I was happy doing that job when the Conco uh, leadership job uh, became available and I was mm -hmm. recalled uh, to be the first um, uh, uh, black Liswati to lead the operation, which is where you and I met. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Certainly, I mean, I can't believe my luck. Um, you, I think, you know, you know, you've just summed in the most brilliant way a life of a young Satikulu born man. Yes. Uh, and and, and, and his, his journey to conquering the world, to say the least, you know, and it's, 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 it's for me, it's a journey of excellence, because I want to believe that I mean, God is good, obviously, you know, Absolutely. providing opportunities and, 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 and all of that. But there's a certain level of hard work that has to come from your part. Absolutely. You know, attention to detail, uh, discipline, respect for the self and for the others, obviously. Um, I want, one of the things you said is that at the university, that's where you started uh, um, a society for the chemistry students. But for me, right. the question is, is that where you first identified your leadership skills? Or did you see it also at a primary school level, either at Salem, or it's a lesion during your time as, as a right. student there? Yeah, I, I have to say, uh, I really got to realize my leadership uh, potential mm -hmm. at university. Okay. Um, all through primary and high school, I, I had zero passion for leadership. Mm -hmm. I didn't even want to be the school prefect. <laughs> That's just how bad it was. I just didn't, didn't, didn't click that yes. uh, it's something I could do. I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I, for whatever reason, when I got to university, um, I then had a, 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 a hunger mm. uh, to, to make a difference. And to me, leadership is living a, a situation better than what you found. Certainly. And whenever I, I get into any situation, mm. um, uh, the measure of success for me is, is it better uh, after my intervention mm -hmm. than it was mm -hmm. before. before. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was at university that I, I, I felt that uh, strong uh, sense uh, of, of, of leadership. leadership. Um, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's funny though, well, maybe funny is not the right way, but I'll, but I'll use <laughs> funny anyway, because uh, for the most, the most people that I've seen either coming to, in, into their own in leadership at university, have chosen the path of political leadership, you know, SRC yeah. yes. uh, or any of the political societies. Yeah. Um, and for you, though, you, yeah. you thought making a difference would come from actually bridging a gap with business right. and, and, and all of that. It's right. quite a niche. It's, it's, it's different. Yeah, I do realize that now. <laughs> At the time, it was intuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, it really was uh, because I was in my third year when I started this uh, with a few others uh, that we conceptualized this with um, and uh, what what was predominant in my mind was um, you know there was a trend where after you finished your uh, biochemistry degree you either went to become a teacher mm -hmm. or you went to do medicine yes or chemical engineering, mm -hmm. uh, or some something along those lines. Yes. Um, but I was made aware through a conversation with one of my organic chemistry lecturers, Dr. Msonti, mm -hmm. that you know uh, there isn't much that's happening between the university and the local industry. And I thought maybe let's 
uh, obviously the society wasn't just about hard work and whatever. It, we had a lot of fun as well. Oh. It was the whole point. But back to, 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 to your question, really, um, that has been my passion, uh, mm -hmm. to, to really make a, a difference, uh, particularly in the area of business and industry. Mm -hmm. And I think my career has sort of followed that path. And fortunately, uh, as I've transitioned into politics, I'm sort mm -hmm. of in the same space. Certainly, and and I would love to know, you know, briefly about that transition from yeah. corporate. I mean, the, the pinnacle of corporate, uh, North America, obviously Ireland, Eswatini. Yeah. You know, and then now very quickly you have to move into politics. And how has that journey been? Yeah. So before I get into that, you know, I, I was really enjoying my time at Coke, uh, in Eswatini, mm -hmm. leading the operation, working with uh, the most passionate people I've ever worked with and uh, delivering some really, really, really incredible things where, you know, this particular operation was um, in, in a set of about 22, um, was in the top 25% performing operation. Um, and I, I was very, very proud of that. And then I got an offer again to go back to Ireland, this time on a longer, with a longer commitment uh, to do basically the same job I was doing here, mm -hmm. but for one of the plants uh, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And um, it came after six years of leading uh, uh, Concord, and I thought to myself, um, you know, only good can come out of this yes. because it's expanding my scope, yes. expanding my sphere of influence, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, working in Europe, and yes. God knows what might happen after mm -hmm. that. And again, my family was kind to me. We, we off we went to, uh, to, to live in Ireland. Um, and after about three years of doing that, uh, my mother calls me and says, uh, your name has just been called on the radio. <laughs> I'm like, what radio? <laughs> <laughs> she says, uh, 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 SBIS. And I, I say to my mom, uh, called by who for what? <laughs> Uh, she says, well, they were announcing the names of senators uh, for the new parliament. Not high school uh, results, eh? <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I remember it was a Thursday evening and I was very confused uh, because um, I did not have any political bone in my body. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's not a career path that I had envisaged mm. in any shape, way, or form. But um, um, I, I then had to call a few people just to make sure that <laughs> it's the right Mangoba uh, Kumalo, because yeah. there could be many. There could be many, yeah. so certainly. And the next morning, um, it was in the papers who the new senators are. So uh, my sister sent me a, 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 a a picture of uh, the, the newspaper, it, and the name was Mangoba Kumalo in brackets, Coca Cola. <laughs> so there was so no, no mistake yeah. whatsoever who this Mangoba Kumalo was. So, um, the highest honor uh, in any establishment, uh, whether it is your parents, uh, whether it is your pastor, or whether it is your chief, uh, is the call to serve. And as a citizen of the country, for me, uh, there was a, a recognition that was at a very different level from what I had accomplished myself or had, um, you know, been fortunate enough to have been asked by the company that it worked for to do, to be just recognized by the highest authority in the land, His Majesty, yep. uh, that you can make a difference, yeah. uh, particularly at a time when the country was faced with the biggest uh, economic challenge uh, uh, maybe of its lifetime mm -hmm. uh, since independence um, by all accounts. Um, I think once I assimilated that and accepted that, it was very clear to me that I had to come back home. Um, none of the, uh, you know, practical implications um, would have been strong enough to, to cause me to have second doubts about that because wow. it is really uh, a call to serve country mm -hmm. and um, being a, a Christian person, mm -hmm. 
I've always um, attributed every opportunity that I got to God, not my own yeah. abilities uh, and intellect and connections. Uh, those are there, yes. but um, everybody has them. Uh, mm. It is a God factor that uh, I was always attributing to my uh, fortunes. So when it happened, I, I took the attitude that says, I embraced the attitude that says, God has a different plan for my life. Uh, I, I can't think that um, my career is uh, bigger or better than the country. Mm -hmm. That would be very arrogant of me and very short-sighted of me. Definitely. And I would be also saying to, to God that uh, I'm now in charge of my own destiny, which um, uh, I'm not. Um, I, I believe that I influence my destiny by doing the very best I can in whatever situation I find myself find in. Yourself, yeah. But this is something that would have been beyond any realm of imagination. So, long story short, I found myself uh, coming back and um, before long there was a Sibaya called <laughs> and uh, I'm also working on going back after I got sworn in as a senator, going back to Ireland to start my transition back home. Uh, and I'm told to stay because I'm one of the people that are supposed to speak at Sibayeni. This is going to be quite uh, <laughs> um, embarrassing, but uh, that was the first time actually I went oh. into Sibayeni. I'm not to say I'm proud of that, but Certainly. it's just the truth. Yes. And uh, then to go there and then to speak. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, true to form, I prepared well. I gathered my thoughts and I, I spoke um, and uh, I hung around for a, a few days because uh, my tickets then couldn't be changed in such a way that I could leave the next day yes. and uh, I then uh, got to learn uh, I think a day or two after that that I was going to be the Minister of Commerce, Industry and Trade. A whirlwind, eh? Uh, Everything is just happening. So fast. Yeah. yeah. And having to adapt to all of that and, and, and coming to terms with it and make all the plans you have to make, not only to come back home, but also for first of all for being, you know, the senator. Yeah. You must prepare for that job and thinking mm. about, you know, your contribution. And then right. now all of a sudden, boom, again, yeah. Minister of, you know, Commerce. And, and, and that's also quite a big portfolio for the country, especially if you're speaking about the economic crisis and all of that. Yeah. So again, in leadership for some sort of a turnaround strategy for yeah. the country. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think... Um one of the uh, situations that I found is that the, the, the government uh, of the Kingdom of Eswatini is sort of in a very difficult position where there hasn't been meaningful private sector growth uh, in the last uh, maybe decade and a half mm -hmm. uh, or even more. Uh, not that there hasn't been, mm -hmm. but uh, the kind of growth that we've had in the private sector hasn't resulted in a significant growth in our economy. Uh, it hasn't resulted in a significant growth in employment. Yes. Uh, it hasn't resulted in a significant growth in the quality of uh, lives mm. for the ordinary uh, Swazi. Uh, so what has then happened is government has played a bigger role. Um, and um, uh, what that has tended to do was then uh, to increase uh, the government labor force mm -hmm. uh, to such an extent that um, for the Eswatini government 53 percent of our expenditure is salaries. It's quite big. For countries that are, are doing a very poor job at this they're 30 percent. Yes you should be a lot less than 30 percent uh, but once you're at 53 percent it means it is now a government-led economy. Yes. It is a, a known fact globally that that never really works. Mm. You can't sustain that. Yes. Um, government builds the enabling environment, builds the infrastructure, but employment should be a private sector, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, mandate. Yes. And that's what I I view my job to be. So I view my job as Minister of Commerce, Industry, and Trade to create jobs. Yes. Use government to create the enabling environment 
four jobs. Yes. And um, my ministry may not have direct responsibility of most of the sectors mm. that create jobs, whether it is mining, uh, whether it is agriculture, whether it is IT, uh, whether it is tourism, um, uh, whether it is infrastructure, all the different sectors that create jobs mm -hmm. may not be under my direct control. But yes. my role is to be the conduit through which all of these sectors can thrive, uh, play the role of um, a promotion uh, agent mm -hmm. for the country as an investment uh, destination yes. and introduce exceptional efficiency uh, and I think that's where uh, we have to be really 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 good at because every country is fighting for the same investor mm -hmm. every country is looking for the same um, um, you know uh, foreign currency and every country wants to improve uh, its economy using the private sector. So our job in Eswatini is to distinguish ourselves by, um, you know, improving our ease of doing business. Wow. We hope you enjoyed the first of our two-part series with His Excellency the Minister of Commerce, Industry and Trade. Join us again next week as we wrap up this insightful conversation. Remember to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell for notifications. The Half Hour. On the record. For the record.